Thank you for coming to our uh, July meeting. We have this lovely lady here who's going to do a wonderful presentation for us. And uh, what's her name? Hint. Jennifer. <laughs> Jennifer. <laughs> Where does it say that? Okay. Bad eyes. Oh, it's. Uh, I'm. I can just. Jennifer. Let me just start. Let me start. Uh, yeah, my name is is Jennifer Fornorth or Jen. I work at the the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources. I was here last year for a talk. About invasive insects and I apparently I did okay enough that they brought me back and I asked Hillary if I because Hillary was doing it back then I was like mm. do you want to talk about mosquitoes or ticks and she was like well I guess ticks so I guess if, if you think this is good you can invite me back next year for a talk about mosquitoes there we go. Um, all right so what are we going to talk about here first of all the problem with ticks and I guess I should say two things about that one is talking about the problem that ticks cause for people, I'm not going to be giving a talk about like ticks that bite snakes or anything like that. So that's not what this is. The other thing is I am not a medical doctor, so I am not qualified, nor honestly am I interested in trying to diagnose any bite that you have anywhere in your skin that you think might have been caused by a tick or something else. That's not my thing. Go see your doctor for that, okay? Um, all right, so we're gonna talk about the problem with ticks. I'm gonna cover tick biology talk about the most common ticks in Massachusetts and the risk of tick-borne illnesses in our state, and then talk for a bit about how to protect yourself. And I tried to keep in mind what a lot of you guys do in your spare time as a hobby is being outside, um, and sometimes in swampy environments. So I tried to tailor that part of the talk to that. Um, this is where my husband started going, ooh, what are you doing to talk about? <laughs> there aren't too many of these shots, but I just wanted to say, like, why do we care about ticks? I mean, first of all, even if ticks didn't cause disease, they are a nuisance, they're annoying, their bites can become infected and painful and itchy, similar to mosquitoes. But most of all, we care about ticks because they do cause disease. Some of you might have seen this map going around from the CDC earlier this year that was showing that uh, diseases caused by ticks, mosquitoes, and fleas have tripled over the past 13 years. And this map is showing the, where the most reports from ticks come in over the years 2004 to 2016. Basically, the darker the color, the more reports of tick-borne illness. And you'll see that the Northeast is quite a hot spot here. It's in the top 20%, meaning that there are more than 12,000 cases per state in each one of those states. And if we wow. zoom in a little bit a into New England, we see it's not just that <clears throat> we had more than 12,800 cases. <laughs> like, we had way more than that. Here I ranked, I went through a, a, the list and started to rank state by state how many reports of tick-borne illness over that time period of about 12 years. And you see Pennsylvania starts with 74,000. That's a lot more than 12,000. Massachusetts is in fourth place. This is not taking into consideration like land area, population mm. or anything. So the fact that we are fourth in, I mean, for example, California reported less than 2,000 cases of tick-borne illness over the same time period. So the Northeast is definitely a hotspot for tick-borne illness. Some of this reporting is being driven by more awareness. It's likely that a lot of people over the past 10 years have gotten bitten by a tick and didn't realize that they had a, a mild form of something like Lyme disease or something like that. And so when it gets to be more in the media, then people will start going to their doctor about it. That's part of it. But that really doesn't factor into like California having less than 2,000 cases. So it's, mm -hmm. there's definitely something going on in the northeastern part of the state, and definitely in Massachusetts. So in Massachusetts, this is pretty much all being caused by three different ticks. The black-legged tick, which is the rebranding of the deer tick, and I'm going to talk about why we're trying to not call it deer tick in, in a few more slides. Also the dog tick, and now a pretty new species here in Massachusetts, the lone star tick. And here is, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go through this in detail more later, but I just wanted to show you, like if you fill in all the different diseases and viruses that can be transmitted by just those three species. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a little horrifying, mm -hmm. right? And I'm gonna go over those in detail in a few more slides. <laughs> but let's talk about how this, you know, how ticks get, get disease and transmit it to humans and to other animals. 
the tick life cycle is actually, for the ticks we're going to talk about today, is a two-year life cycle. So what happens is that the adults lay eggs that hatch in the spring. So that's like pretty early spring, like April or May. And then the eggs turn into larvae. And you can tell the difference between a larval tick and an adult tick because the larval tick only has six legs, and then the nymphs and the adults have eight legs. So at the larval stage, they emerge from the eggs and they need to feed. But they're very tiny and they tend to be very close to the ground when they hatch. And so their first meal is gonna be something pretty tiny, like a bird or a mouse, <coughs> something like that. At this point, the larva has no disease in it because it's just hatched from the egg, it's, blood, you know, it's clean, but it's taking this first blood meal and it could be taking it from an animal that has you know, lime or tularemia or something like that, depending on what species it is. And then those larvae stay in the larval stage until the next spring where they molt and turn into nymphs. And every time they molt like that, they need to feed again. So, and the interesting thing, at least about deer ticks, black legged ticks, <laughs> is that every time they feed, they tend to feed on a different type of animal. So they're, I think they call that a, a, a Catholic feeding type. Like you just, you need, you don't just want to feed on one thing. So dog ticks will pretty much just feed on dogs. They will occasionally bite humans, but they pretty much want to feed on dogs. But the black legged ticks, and also um, the Lone Star ticks, they will feed on a number of different animals. So at the larval stage, you get these you know, little tiny creatures, rodents and birds. At the nymph stage, they will feed on slightly larger rodents. They can feed on people. They might feed on deer, fox, things like that. And then the nymphs, after they feed, at this point, they might already have picked up a disease at the larval stage. So when they feed, they could be transmitting the disease depending on what kind of animal they bite, to that animal. Um, and then once they do that, then they are going to survive through the summer and then turn into adults in the fall. And then the adults will survive through the winter and lay eggs again in the spring. So that's over the course of two years. Um, some of the interesting things to observe here is that I know this chart shows the winter as a dead zone, but the reality is, and you've probably seen this if you're out in the field, is that if it's February and it's suddenly 70 degrees in February, which seems to be happening every year, you will see tick activity, you will see adults out. And those adults could have had two chances to be exposed to different types of disease and pick up that disease in their blood. Uh, and so when either the adults or the nymphs feed on another animal, they're taking out blood, but their mouth parts are also excreting saliva in to your, you know, to the animal that they're biting. And if there are any pathogens in their bodies, then they're excreting them into that animal. If it's something like a deer, and this is part of the reason why we want to rebrand the whole deer tick, black leg tick thing. Like a deer is not a carrier of Lyme disease. It is a dead, what they call a dead end host. So you, they don't really get Lyme disease. And if a nymph bites a deer, it's not going to pick up Lyme disease and then give it to the next thing it bites. That's mm. just not how it works. What deer are for black legged ticks is um, like an Uber. <laughs> They're basically a way of bringing them into new environments uh, and not actually spreading the disease. So in terms of tick feeding behavior, and this is something interesting to note, so I keep talking about like nymphs versus adults, and, and why does this matter? It matters because at the nymph stage, they're very low to the ground, and so you're gonna pick up nymphs at, this, at the time of year where they're active. So right about now, um, actually I would say that I was seeing them more towards the end of May and the beginning of June, it hasn't been that bad so far, but maybe with the rain it's gonna pick up again. But you're gonna be seeing the ticks that you're going to be seeing at this time of year are the nymphs. And that means that your greatest risk of exposure is walking around in like leaf litter and things like that. Mm -hmm. But the adults look for hosts higher up. They're seeking larger animals, and so you'll see them in vegetation that's like this, you know, up to your waist or up to where a deer's flank would be. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're, they tend to be higher up. And it can be trickier to manage not coming into contact with them, especially if you're just 
of bushwhacking. Uh, but this kind of feeding behavior is called questing. So they basically get into position in an area and they put their legs out and as soon as they sense somebody coming by or an animal coming by, they just grab on. And this is an actual picture of one at the end of a blade of grass. Um, so the larvae and the nymphs will be questing very low to the ground and the adult ticks will quest higher up at the tips of vegetation. But some ticks, including the Lone Star ticks, and sometimes the American dog ticks will quest, will hunt instead of quest. That means they're actively going after their prey. So how do they know when prey is nearby? They, a lot of them don't even have eyes. They can't see very well if they do have eyes. So they're detecting hosts through scent, body odor, through heat changes in, in like the ambient heat in the area, moisture levels, vibrations. So stepping will pick up on them and they get ready to, to grab on. Um, some of them can recognize shadows. So they don't have good eyesight, but they can see like something is approaching. Uh, and some of the hunting ticks, so the, those were the, the questing ticks that are basically going to stand by with like a thumb out until something <laughs> walks by and then grab onto it. Uh, the hunting ticks actually are, have been found to be attracted to sources of carbon dioxide or carbon, carbon monoxide. And sometimes I was reading that the Lone Star ticks will be attracted to areas that are by roadsides because of those kinds of emissions showing up, which is really weird and not, not necessarily the best evolutionary uh, behavior for them. Uh, but dog ticks will be attracted to carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide and will sometimes go after those sources in search of a host to feed on. So again, the larvae and the nymphs are going to be found in leaf litter and they're going to be most active in the early summer. And the larval ticks don't carry disease until after they feed, so we don't talk too much about the larva, but I can say that if you find a tick on you and it only has six legs, then you're virtually safe from contracting a disease from it because it won't have had any disease in it when it fed on you. Uh, and then again, the adults are found in fall, winter, spring and are typically found at like thigh or waist height. So this is something I've seen go viral a couple of times now where because it's so difficult to describe the size of a tick and they really want to convey that it's small, that somebody decided it would be a good idea to show it on food, <laughs> which tends to freak people out, but I figure you guys can handle this, right? Can anybody see the tick here? Yeah. Yep. Little pop. There. Um, it is about the, the deer tick is very tiny, about the size of a poppy seed. Until it starts to feed, an engorged female will be very noticeable, by, but really at that point it's too late. <laughs> and how do you kill that? I had one last week walking on my tablet that size. That's an interesting question. I don't think I addressed in the talk, so you're asking how to kill them. Um, they are pretty much like cockroaches in that you can't really squish them or destroy them or anything. So there's two things that I do. One thing is I try to carry a little vial with me if I know I'm going to be out. I put them in the vial and that vial goes in the freezer when I get home and after a few days I can do, throw, they're just dead. The other thing you can do, and I never remember to do this, but it's such a great trick, is to bring a little roll of masking tape with you, and when you encounter the tick, just take a piece of, not masking tape, uh, scotch, tape. scotch tape, yeah, the oh. translucent stuff. So say you have the tick like right here, you cut a piece of tape, you put the sticky side down, pick the tick up, then you fold <laughs> it over and it's completely like stuck, yeah. and then you can just like throw it in the garbage or whatever, or put it in the freezer, and it's just, you've Taking it down, basically. So. And I went crazy looking for matches. <laughs> oh yeah, don't do any of the stuff involving burning. <laughs> no burning, no Vaseline, no gas, none of that. It doesn't. All it's going to do is hurt you. Um, you don't need to do that to kill a tick. Really, just oh, free, okay. freeze them or isolate them with like tape of some kind. Tape. That's a good idea. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk more about why we why we're doing the talk today because we care about getting we don't want to get sick from ticks. So we're going to talk about the three different types that we're going to see here and the types of disease that we have to be concerned about. But first, a little bit about the ID. Here are pictures of the three life stages of the black-legged tick. Here's the larva. Here's the nymph again, very tiny, like a poppy seed. Here's the adult male and the adult <coughs> female. Uh, you'll notice that the hard covering on the male covers the whole body, 
but on a female, it's only about that big. That whole thing is going to be ready to expand <coughs> through engorgement after feeding on blood so that she can have all the nutrients she needs to produce eggs. So the first thing we have to be concerned about with black legged ticks, I think this is just in alphabetical order, because I suppose everybody's already heard about Lyme. How many of you have heard about anaplasmosis? So my dog has had anaplasmosis mm -hmm. at least once, and she was very ill, had to be hospitalized because her fever was so high. Um, and then was on a lot of different medications for a very long time, um, but was fine, but still, it's not a pleasant thing for a pet to go through, but people can also get this particular bacterial disease. And the symptoms for anaplasmosis, and you're gonna see this repeated over and over for most of the conditions that you can pick up from ticks, are very flu-like. So fever, headache, chills, aches, fatigue. I can see where it would be tough for somebody to really know whether they just weren't feeling well or had a tick bite. It's always best to check in with your doctor if you're not sure. Uh, sometimes more extreme symptoms with anaplasmosis include abdominal pain, nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, cough, fun things like that. Um, the symptoms of anaplasmosis will, the onset of symptoms, so when they start to occur, are about a week to two weeks after you've been exposed through a tick bite. And the treatment, because it's a bacterial disease, is a course of antibiotics. And the important thing with anything like this is to catch it early um, so that you don't start to exhibit some of the more extreme symptoms. And I tried to put in the time for transmission at the bottom of each one of these slides for each disease because I think that's really important. And it's something where there's a lot of, like, myths going around about how long it takes to pick up a disease from a tick and this is from an actual study that was done it was done mostly on rodents but it's still a good indicator of how long it could take so if you find a tick on your body that you know you picked up a few hours ago then the chances of it having transmitted a disease to you are actually very small, which is good, because you don't want to go to the doctor and get on a course of antibiotics every time you get a tick bite, because you will end up with some really bad bacterial infection when you're older, and you will be resistant to all of the different antibiotics, and that's not good for you either. So you have to maintain the line between caution and alarm <laughs> so that you can protect yourself for your whole life. So the approximate transition Transmission time for anaplasmosis is anywhere from basically one to two days. So the tick has to be attached and feeding for at least a day. So that, that gives you plenty of time to check for something like that, if you're aware. Another thing that you can pick up from the black-legged tick is babesiosis. This is actually pretty rare as far as we know in Massachusetts right now. It's caused by a microscopic parasite that infects red blood cells. It's related in a way to malaria, and if you get treated for babesiosis, you actually get a course of antibiotics, but also these anti-parasitic um, drugs that are sort of in the quinine family, which is what you would do to deal with malaria. Um, the symptoms again, fever, headache, chills, fatigue, all those things, but also dark urine. Um, often the symptoms are very mild, so it's possible that there are lots of people that have gotten babesiosis and they just don't realize it. So it might be more common in Massachusetts than we know. The symptoms might come up anywhere from one to eight weeks after you've been exposed, which makes it even more of a challenge to know what caused it. And to recognize it as a tick-borne illness. And the transmission time for this one is even longer. It's thought to be, to need three days or more to be transmitted. Uh, there's also Borreliosis, which is fairly recently found in the New England area. It's, a, again, a bacterial disease like anaplasmosis. It is caused by a Borrelia bacteria, which is the same genus as the one that causes Lyme disease. And the symptoms are fairly similar to Lyme disease. And a lot of times folks will test negative for Lyme, and they won't know why. And it could be because they have um, Borreliosis instead. The symptoms onset about 12 to 16 days after exposure, and it takes anywhere from a day to several days to start to, for, for it to actually transmit to a human or a, another mammal. Lyme disease is the one I'm sure you've all heard about already. 
Um, it is a bacterial disease caused by Borrelia burgdorferi. The early stages of Lyme are that, you know, we always hear about that bullseye rash. Mm -hmm. um, the erythema migraines where you get, you get a red rash and then the center starts to heal but you still have this ring around it. I think I've got a picture on the next slide. Um, and you get a headache and stiff neck and fever. You might get swollen glands. And then some of the late stage um, symptoms of Lyme that can occur in some cases after you didn't even realize you were exposed to Lyme and suddenly now you felt a little icky like you might have had the flu but now you're suddenly getting like arthritis or severe cases, um, meningitis, so swelling of the base of the brain and the spine, facial weakness or Bell's palsy, a lot of really extreme uh, symptoms that can show up in folks that didn't get treatment because they didn't realize they were exposed to Lyme. Uh, the symptoms could start anywhere from 3 to 30 days after exposure. Uh, it can be treated with antibiotics, especially when it's caught early. And the time for transmission, again, for Lyme, it's at least a day to 72 hours. There's the hmm. standard bull rash. Well, that's not a bad picture to see. But mm -hmm. th that only happens in, like, I think 60% of the cases of people who get Lyme. Mm -hmm. The other 40 don't see this rash at all, or they see just the... The center part is a rash, and you can't tell, like, was that a mosquito bite or mm -hmm. something else. Um, so the bullseye rash, don't, don't use that as the only indicator if you're concerned you might have been exposed to Lyme. The last thing I want to talk about is the one that probably will fuel, fuels the hysteria over ticks and tick-borne illness. And I guess all I can say about Powassan is that it's, it's likely that a lot of people have gotten it and not had severe symptoms, but you might have seen in the news that there was a case, I think, in Maine last year. Um, they're saying it's very rare, but I think they're not sure because somebody that has mild symptoms doesn't get tested. I think it might end up being more common. Um, this is a virus that's being transmitted by deer ticks. It's not a bacterial disease, and so there's no like antiviral medication to cure it if you have an extreme case of it. Most people feel little or no symptoms, but some people are going to develop either meningitis or encephalitis, so swollen brain, fever, headache, vomiting, confusion, you know, speech issues, and even seizures in severe cases. Uh, the interesting thing about Powassan virus is it's a virus, and it is transmitted quite immediately after you are, um, after a tick attaches and starts to feed. So within 15 to 30 minutes if the tick is attached, you might have been exposed to Powassan. Um, I will talk a little bit about what you can do if you are concerned that you might be exposed to something like that. Um, I will say again, it's very rare to have the extreme symptoms. Okay, so here is the results from a lab that takes, that I think I'm gonna talk about this on another few slides, but this is a lab out at UMass that takes samples from the public and tests for, of ticks and tests them for the presence of disease. And this is a map showing where they got all their samples from. Um, this isn't necessarily an indicator of where they have more ticks or fewer ticks, it's just where people were most likely to send in the samples. But it does show that it was pretty widespread throughout the state. And then this giant chart is showing where they actually had prevalence of tick-borne illness. And this is what I think is interesting. So, this is Lyme disease right here, and you see that this is the highest percentage out of any of those columns. So that's one thing I get out of this chart. The other thing is you sort of look and see, well, okay, about 30% 30, 30 of all ticks test positive for Lyme in all the different counties of Massachusetts, except for Nantucket. 62% of all ticks, so they have a really high incidence of Lyme on that island. Um, some other higher, one. yeah, I mean, they really, I mean, Hampton County was low and Suffolk County was low. I don't know, there's not a lot of tick habitat in Suffolk County, but there are a lot of mice, so I, I guess I shouldn't speculate about why that happened, but seriously, the number for Nantucket was extreme. Uh, the next column is for anaplasmosis, and you can see, again, for some reason, high incidence of it in Suffolk mm -hmm. County, even after the very low incidence of, um, of Lyme disease. And a tick can have several of these at the same time in its blood. I think that was all I wanted to point out there. Dukes County is the vineyard, and I noticed that it's got a higher percentage of um, babesiosis, mm -hmm. and also this is babesiosis plus Lyme disease there. But
but otherwise, you know, the chances of a tick having more than one of those diseases in in its body are pretty low, except for these little spikes here on the vineyard. So keep your pants tucked in when you're on the islands, I guess. <laughs> Um, all right, so a little bit more about ticks and tick-borne illness. This is the American dog tick. The adults are much larger if you compare them to the deer tick, and the other thing about them is that they have more of a, like a, a marbled or mottled look to their bodies. Um, oh, I forgot I brought cards. And I only brought a few, but I think there's almost enough here. Uh, these are really cool transparent mm. ID cards. You're welcome to take one if you want. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have enough for anybody, but we ran out. Um, you can have, you, they're translucent, so you can hold it up to a tick, like in your hand or something, and compare it in size and color. Uh, keep that in your wallet so that, you know, if you get bit by a, a well, chances are if you see a dog tick, it's really not interested in biting you most of the time. So that's one thing kind of chill out, but you don't want it by your dog either. <laughs> so I think we have two diseases to talk about. This first one, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, is extremely rare in Massachusetts, but I've seen some cases reported. It's another bacterial disease transmitted, but this one's transmitted only by the dog tick. The symptoms are a really sudden onset of fever and very severe headaches. Uh, sometimes you can get very bad muscle pain. You might get a rash that starts in your arms and legs and then starts to spread over your entire body. Uh, sometimes stomach pain and coughing. So the symptoms are really all over the place on something like this. Um, the take home message there is to keep an eye on your body and whether you've been bit by a tick so that you know if you get sick whether it might be related to that. Uh, the symptom onset for Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is typically about seven days after you've been exposed to a tick bite. It can be treated with antibiotics, um, and it takes only about, it could, it typically takes 24 hours to be transmitted if the tick attaches to you, but there's some evidence showing that it might be able to be transmitted in a very short time. They just don't have enough data right now to know. Uh, but again, dog ticks rarely bite humans, so the chances of exposure to that particular illness are pretty small. There's also tularemia, which is a bacterial disease that can be spread in a number of different ways. You might have heard of some of the cases of folks being exposed to mouse droppings and inhaling, um, inhaling the bacteria that way uh, in really heavily infested uh, areas that are very heavily infested with mice you could be exposed. Um, you will get symptom onset usually in three to five days, but it could take up to three weeks. And at that point, folks will get a, a sore on their body, swollen glands, sometimes very bad muscle pain and, and nausea, um, possibly stomach pain and cough. Is that? I think that that is incorrect. I think it should just say development of a skin sore and swollen glands. It looks like I have a copy and pasting error. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, okay, so again, can be treated with antibiotics, if it's, especially if it's caught early. It takes 48 hours to be transmitted. So a tick would have to be on you and attached for two days. Um, if you're checking yourself enough, that shouldn't happen, hopefully. The third and final tick we have in the area is the Lone Star Tick, uh, so-called because the females have this bright white spot right in the center there, sort of star-shaped, right? Um, this is a tick that really wasn't known here maybe like 10 years ago or so, and they had, they found a concentration of them on Cape Cod, and now we're starting to see them scattered. I, I had a friend who ha found some on his dog when he was walking out on the Blue Hills Reservation, and I think they found them in some places in Western Mass. So we know it's around, but we also know there's a lot of them on the Cape. The most interesting thing that the Lone Star Tick can transmit is something called alpha-gal. Has anybody heard of this? The red meat just... allergy? Oh, it's... no. I know, right? Oh, no. <laughs> Not just that, but reading that like pork is actually a red meat, no matter what the pork council says. So, oh, no. that, you know. so basically, um, you could pick up this red meat allergy when the carbohydrate I'm not even going to try to say that. Mm. The galactose carbohydrate is expelled in the tick's saliva. And then 
for people that are sensitive, once that's happened, then when they're exposed to red meat, they've produced these antibo antibodies that cause an allergic reaction. And that can vary from needing like a Benadryl to needing an EpiPen, depending on how sensitive you are. And they're not really sure how long the allergic reaction lasts, whether it fades over time or not. There's not really any cure for it. And they don't know how long it takes to be transmitted from a tick that bites you. They just know it can be caused by Lone Star Tick. That's the only tick they know of. And that once you get exposed to the tick, that about two weeks after exposure, if you eat beef, pork, lamb, venison, and sometimes if you just drink cow's milk, you have that reaction and it stays with you. That to me is almost the most frightening thing on this whole list. Mm -hmm. The other thing that Lone Star Tick can um, carry is something called ehrlichiosis, which is another bacterial disease that has similar symptoms to Lyme. Um, the symptoms will start to occur about one to two weeks after you've been exposed to an infected tick, but it takes, again, at least a day for the tick to transmit um, the, the bacteria to your bloodstream. And then the Lone Star Tick has the same um, chance of passing along tularemia. I'm not gonna go into detail on that because I talked about it with the dog tick already. And can also carry something called starry or star eye. I don't know how, it depends on who you talk to, how to say it. Southern tick associated rash illness. They don't actually know what causes this. They used to think that it was another kind of Borrelia bacteria like Lyme disease, um, but that's been disproven. And they just know that you get a rash like Lyme disease, you get really tired, you get a fever, you have muscle and joint aches. Um, <clears throat> you start to exhibit these symptoms seven days after you've been exposed. They don't know how long it takes to transmit it. This is an example of a rash <coughs> that starts out on your skin. Um, antibiotics can work, but the effectiveness isn't really clear. This is just something so new um, that they don't really know how to deal, quite how to deal with it yet. Okay, um, I feel like there was one more thing I wanted to say about this. Oh, right, uh, why is the transmission time so long for so many of these things? It's because the bacteria needs time to multiply in the tick's blood and gorge body before it hits a point where it's coming out of the tick in great enough amounts that it could infect you. Okay, so now that I've hopefully gotten you <laughs> horrified enough, we're gonna talk about what you should be doing to keep from getting bit by a tick. And so we're gonna talk about personal protection, which is basically all on you in terms of clothing and possibly repellents and stuff like that. I'm gonna talk a little bit about habitat management for the habitat that you have any control over uh, and what to do if you find a tick that, that actually bit you. So in terms of personal protection, it's sort of divided into three sections. One, how, you know, what clothing should you be wearing and how should you be wearing it? Two, um, you know, is it a good idea to wear a repellent or some other kind of pesticide that kills ticks or repels ticks? And three, like how can you modify your behavior in a way that keeps you from getting um, bit by ticks? So first of all, personal protection clothing. Use light colored clothing so that if a tiny little poppy seed sized tick is crawling on you, you have a chance of seeing it because the ticks are dark. So if you're going out and you're all suited up in black, you're gonna miss things. Uh, long sleeves and pants if possible, if you can deal with it, right? Because <laughs> when it's like 95 degrees out, you feel like you're gonna die if you wear sleeves. But, you know, I. I can do this for, from the waist down. I can't, sometimes I can't deal with the long sleeves, but they do make the like, field shirts that are wicking so that if you get sweaty, it kind of keeps you cool. You might want to think about if you are going into an area you know always brings ticks home with you. Uh, keep your ankles and your feet covered, so don't be going out with your tevas on. <laughs> Wear boots, wear socks. Tuck your pants into your socks because especially those nymphal ticks are going to be coming from the ground up, they're not falling on your head. So if they get on your feet, they're gonna go right up your pants if you don't have your pants tucked in. Meanwhile, if you tuck your pants into your socks, you have some kind of a chance of like looking down while you're walking and seeing something running up your leg. 
You don't want it running up the inside. <coughs> the other thing to consider is permethrin treated clothing. And again, I was thinking about you guys and you know what the reason why you're going to be out in the field, you know, you're out there herping, right? Is it feasible for you to be treating your clothing with permethrin? Is anybody doing that? I'm curious. Are you not doing it for a specific reason, or you just don't even know what I'm talking about? <laughs> right mm. now? That's um, it. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. Come on, I mean, uh, some people uh, with immune diseases of any kind or allergic reactions mm. can't have uh, permethrin and other things yes. you know, around them or on mm. their skin. That's a really good point. Some people can't use pesticides for certain reasons. And that's definitely an issue. I have a friend who's allergic to D2. Um, it's possible that permethrin treated clothing might be an option for some of those people. I don't know. Because you're not spraying a chemical on, it's not really getting into contact with your skin, it's just on your clothing. And so one of the things that I've been using this year for my own bushwhacking experiences are these are tick gators hmm. these are impregnated with permethrin and they go over your clothes hmm. so and they're velcro and they're honestly I'm gonna blame my husband for buying me the dark ones and not the light ones that's his fault though <laughs> but anyway they go around your pants at the with the bottom of them around your ankle and then you just hmm. strap them in and they're treated with permethrin and they also have this grid fabric here, so a tick crawls on here and gets confused and lost. And while it's doing that, it's getting exposed to the permethrin, and then it just mm. never makes it up the gators. That's at least what's been happening to me this summer so far. Um, that said, permethrin is known to be toxic in aquatic environments. Mm. So if you're in a swamp, you don't want to be dunking these in the water, and you don't want to be in a situation where an amphibian is going to come into contact with permethrin, because, or D, actually, because that's not safe for them. This might work in some environments, though. So you might want to have a pair of these so you know when you're going to be out in a dry area, and I don't know, you're just looking for snakes or something. <laughs> um, because permethrin is actually used sometimes to treat snakes that are having severe issues with, I think, insect. I don't know exactly what, but I saw when I was looking trying to figure out what story to tell you guys in terms of using repellents and whether it worked for somebody that's dealing with reptiles and amphibians. Um, so I know that permethrin is sometimes used to treat parasites on mm -hmm. snakes at least, but it's, it's considered so very you, toxic to fish and frogs. So what do you get permethrin in to treat your clothing? So you can buy is it. Is it a spray? Yeah, you can buy a spray to treat your own clothing. You can buy clothing or gear that's already impregnated with and it lasts for like months. Uh, or you can, there are places that you can find online where you can send them your clothes and they'll treat them with permethrin and then send them back to you so that you don't have to do it and it lasts for like <coughs> seven washes or something. It's not like a spray like this. <coughs> Like off or something that has there's a it spray in it. that you use to treat your clothing. It never goes on your skin. And where do you get that spray? You should be able to get it at any place that sells insect repellents at this right. point. So big box stores will sell them, and I'm sure there are other places that do as well. Mm. But again, oh, the other thing is that wet permethrin needs to stay away from cats. Mm. Not dogs, just cats. And only when it's wet, as far as I know. Um, but anyway, I, d I didn't want to not tell you about this because mm -hmm. a lot of people are using this as an alternative to DEET because they don't want to be, they want, especially for ticks, like they're not interested in repelling ticks, they just want to kill them mm -hmm. and this works for them and then they don't have to touch their skin with it and it's to them, to a lot of people it's a safer method. But anyway, some folks are still going the repellent method and there's certainly effectiveness of various levels with different repellents. DEET is still known to be the best at repelling both ticks and mosquitoes. Uh, products with picaridin, you can look for something that says it has IR 3535. You can use oil of lemon eucalyptus or something that has PMD in it, which is a, just the active ingredient in oil of lemon eucalyptus. Uh, and there's also something now called 2 under canone, which is an extract from the root plant 
which I just read about and have never actually seen in a product, but you could keep an eye out for it, for people that have like a deep allergy or are just looking for a more natural alternative. But basically, the level of effectiveness goes down the more you go down that list of things. So, um, you know, oil and lemon eucalyptus last, but not as long as, as deep wood. Can you even use, like, it's natural, but it's still a toxic yeah, thing for it. Yeah, I can't use So you're just going to want to wear, like, a Timex <laughs> and sweat a lot. Go around my own little bubble. Yeah, mm -hmm. there you go. <laughs> what doesn't work for repellents are a lot of those products that are listed as natural. Yeah. So if it has lemongrass, citronella, soybean oil, rosemary, peppermint, garlic, none of those actually work. Um, Sounds like dinner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> basically, right? But that's the way they push those products, because uh -huh. they sound harmless. But that's not what you need to keep ticks away. Um, this is going to be on the video, right? But if yes. you want to look into whether, you know, what repellent you should be using, you can go to that EPA website and go through a few questions and they'll suggest a product for you. Um, or a <laughs> right? So here's something about your behavior. Maybe you might, if, if you're not already doing these things, you might want to change your behavior, especially if you either don't want to or can't use chemicals to protect you from ticks. Make smart choices about when and how to be outdoors. If you know you're going to be encountering ticks, then why are you wearing shorts, you know? Uh, if you're gonna wear shorts, then are you checking your legs every 10 minutes or half hour? And then I have some tips for you in terms of what to do, like if you think you might have been exposed to ticks, um, to kind of keep them from biting you. Uh, so you want to pay attention to like what time of year it is and what kind of habitat you're in. Uh, in late spring and summer, again, when those nymphs are active, you want to be careful around leaf litter. Uh, in summer and fall, the adult ticks will be questing higher up in the vegetation. So if you're not intentionally trying to go bushwhacking, then maybe you want to stay on the trail because the, seriously there will be ticks about with their legs like this waiting on the side. Um, you know, just be aware if that's what kind of a situation you're going into. Also, again, tick season is year-round now. I know I said this earlier. Adult ticks will be active anytime it's warm outside. It doesn't matter what month it is. It does not matter if snow is on the ground. They're around. Uh, also, if you have a mouse problem mm -hmm. in your house or apartment, then you probably also have a tick problem because mice are one of the primary hosts for um, black-legged ticks. So, and that can be year-round. You have a cat and you have a mouse problem, you might have a cat with, with black-legged ticks on it. So keep your, your cat treated or checked too. Okay, so another thing to look at is location. Areas where you know there's gonna be a lot of rodent activity. Areas where you know there's a lot of deer activity. Because like I said before, deer will carry adult ticks into a new area and they'll drop off to lay their eggs and create whole new generations of ticks. Um, Interesting places to keep an eye on, rock walls, wood piles, because those harbor rodents. And this is my completely speculative, unproven theory for why the New England area is so infested with ticks, because New England has like miles and miles and miles of rock walls out in the woods from like long ago. And man, chipmunks and voles and uh, mice love to nest in rock walls. So it's like that perfect combination of an area where it's like out in the woods and so the ticks are there and then the rodents are there and then the people are there. And so it's a great place to get exposed. Okay, so here's how to really be smart about checking for ticks. Even if you aren't being that smart about protecting yourself from ticks when you're out in the field. Keep an eye on yourself and your companions while in the field. Who here has ever picked a tick off of somebody else? I certainly have. <laughs> or you could tell them that they have a tick on them or something. Uh, consider packing either a little plastic vial with you to scoop up a tick, or again, that um, scotch tape mm -hmm. so that you can just pick one up. I saw there was some silly meme going around on Facebook where they were saying just take those like uh, lint rollers. It's like the masking tape on the on a stick. Mm -hmm. And you just you know roll it up and down your body, and it'll catch all the ticks. And I'm like, you know, I mean, I guess you could do that. But as long as you're doing something. Um, check your body for ticks that might have attached while you're active. So let's say you went out in the field, even if you're wearing repellent, you should still be checking for ticks behind your ears, on your scalp, 
in the folds of your knees and your elbows. Basically any warm, moist area of your body, yes, even there. And you know what I say when I say there. They will go there. So you need to check. Because <laughs> you don't want to have a tick feeding there. And you don't have to remove a tick there. Um, but they gravitate to areas that are warm, dark, and moist. Mm -hmm. And so what I do is when I'm out, when I get home, I throw all my clothes into the dryer, put them on high, put it on high for 10 minutes. That will kill any of the ticks that are that were on my clothes. It also gives me a chance to like get them off of me if they were on my clothes, like everything, my shoes, not my shoes, my socks, and just everything. And then I get into the shower, and the shower is going to rinse away any ticks that are on me that might not have attached, that I might not have seen because they're very tiny, especially when they're nymphs. And then maybe I'm gonna feel a tick like in my scalp or something that I wouldn't have noticed otherwise, but the shower is giving me a chance to like do a tick check, you know? Or, you know, have someone else check you. <laughs> it's just important yeah, to get Shower checked. with a friend, save water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure the friend's okay with that, all right? <laughs> if you find a tick in your body and it hasn't yet attached to you, like you can just pick it off very easily, then you're not at risk for a disease if it is attached to you, so like the head and the mouth parts are embedded in your skin, then what you're supposed to do, best case scenario, is you have a pair of fine point tweezers to grip the tick as close to your skin as possible, and you're going to pull it straight out with a very steady pressure, and if it all works out, then the entire tick just comes out, and you can, you, then you can deal with it from there. If you can't manage to do it right, then, and like sometimes the mouth parts might still be in there, then the current recommendation is just to kind of let it heal naturally. Don't worry about trying to like dig through your skin to dig thing to dig it out because that could lead to some kind of other infection. Um, and it will really just kind of heal over it, and then it'll just pop out as your skin grows up again. Um, you can use tick spoons and keys. I meant to get mine out of my wallet. I'm gonna go grab mine. I was just at a training where I was told that fine point tweezers really are the only, the best way to take care of a tick. And then they admitted that very few people have or have access to fine point tweezers. Mm -hmm. Maybe you guys do because you work with like reptiles, I don't know. But anyway, here's an example of a, a tick key. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that you put it down on the, the fat side and you just start to pull and it like catches it and pulls it out. So you could easily get something like this at like, uh, you know, an outdoor store mm -hmm. and put it on your keychain or throw it in your car or something. They have tick spoons too that often attach to keychains. Um, that's a really easy thing for like five bucks or something to put on you so that you can just get the thing off of you because you don't want it attached for any longer than you have to. You should probably save the tick. Once you've cleaned the wound with either rubbing alcohol or soapy water to kind of clean it out, um, you should probably note, you know, hey, I found a tick today mark it down on a calendar or something, and make a note where on your body it was so that you, you can check to see if some kind of a rash or something develops there because you could have been exposed to Lyme. Also, you have that tick, so now if you're concerned that you were exposed to Lyme, you could get that tick tested. Um, you want to note whether it was engorged as well, so has it started feeding on your blood yet? Um, that gives you an indication of how long it's been attached. When they first get attached, they're going to be very flat and tiny, but they will really balloon up like that once they start to feed. They don't even look like themselves anymore. They're just a giant sack of blood at that point. Um, so that's another reason to be concerned, because that was a long time that the tick was on there and could be exposing you to different pathogens. You can, go, you can Google the UMass Laboratory of Medical Zoology. That's the place in Massachusetts that will test ticks for you. You can go to tickreport.com, too. Um, it's generally not free to have the tick tested. <laughs> it is about, I think right now for most towns, it's about $50 for the standard tick screen. And then if you want the full screen, which includes Powassan virus, then you need to pay $100, um, which is a lot of money. And if you're getting exposed to, like every week to a tick, that no one's really gonna be able to afford that. But they did just get a grant to help cut the cost, and so depending on what town you're in, if you go and fill out uh, the information, they might subsidize it. So if you really want to get tested because you feel like you're not feeling right and you're not not getting the right 
response from medical professionals, you could just get it tested. Um, the other thing is, again, talk to your doctor if you develop any symptoms. Yes? Uh, how long do you have, like say you pick the tick off yourself, you throw up the freezer or something, how long do you have, how long does that body last that it could be tested? Yeah, the, I think it's an interesting question. They have a whole section about that on the website, and okay. they, it doesn't, it, it doesn't seem to matter yeah. to them. It was at least several days, and it might have been a week or two. I'm trying to remember. I cannot remember. I'll have to like post a link to the group, to the Facebook page or mm, something like, with mm. it. But I just, I remember being annoyed at the, we were getting one tested that bit my husband earlier in the year, and just to see what the whole test process was like, and he left it out on the counter in a baggie, and I got really mad at him. <laughs> and they were just like, they didn't care. And it didn't have any, they didn't have any problems with the DNA testing. So, I don't know, maybe that's, it's just something about ticks and the way that they are so resilient. Because, um, I mean, you could put a live tick in a vial and just leave it for weeks and it will still be alive in a lot of cases, so, yeah. Okay, so just a few more things to talk about today. One, I just wanted to touch briefly on habitat management. So this is more like for your yard, although if you, you know, a place like this, the folks that manage this place might want to think about something like this. Um, remove leaf litter from areas where people or pets are active because that's basically a giant tick nest at certain times of the year. Uh, keep grass cut short, that will keep the ticks away. Keep wood piles neat and dry, because otherwise they're gonna harbor both rodents and ticks. Consider, if it's possible, create a barrier between your lawn and any wooded area of about three feet, use either wood chips or gravel or something like that. That actually keeps ticks from coming out of the woods and into your lawn because they don't like that kind of habitat and they don't cross through. Uh, use fencing to keep wild animals out of your yard, especially deer and um, things like that. Some people use chemical treatments in their yard like synthetic pyrethroids, natural products like garlic oil or cedar oil that are of varying effectiveness where you just treat the edge of the perimeter of your property and it keeps things from coming in. Uh, it works, but it, it you have to keep up with it. You have to keep getting treatments every few weeks and if it rains, it, it doesn't work anymore. Um, and if all your neighbors around you aren't treating and their lawns or yards are wild, then it's really not gonna be that effective for you, but some people have had luck with that. There's also ways that you can treat the animals that carry ticks. So they have these things called tick tubes, which are basically they kind of look like toilet paper or paper towel tubes filled with a cottony substance that's been treated with um, an insecticide. And mice will grab that and take it back to their nest and then it kills all the ticks that are in the nest. Um, yes, go ahead. The only problem with that is uh, if a snake then eats that mouse, mm -hmm. that is potentially toxic. Yes, that is not the only problem with that. Yeah. But, and, I mean, you raise a really good point. Some people Some just it. really want no ticks in their yard and yeah. they aren't thinking about the consequences of it. Um, but that is absolutely true. Uh, I'm not sure how much, how long the effect lasts and how toxic it would be to an animal that ate the mouse. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, they also have things that will like bring deer up to a, a little feeding station and then swab them with a chemical. <laughs> but I wouldn't want to have to worry about a snake, I don't think. Not up here in Massachusetts anyway, eating a deer. Um, again, of limited effectiveness and stuff like that, you really have to be doing it over an extremely wide area. If you're just trying to do something with a feeding station in your yard and none of your neighbors are doing it, then you're really not going to be seeing much of an effect according to studies that have been done. But I just kind of want to say like, these are some of the things that do get done if that works for you. Or if you know it's an area with no snakes, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that's possible. But um, The other thing you can do is get educational materials, like if you are managing an area, you could get these free signs from the CDC. You can just Google CDC tick signage, and these are like real, like printed on um, metal signs where you could just say like, hey, this is an area that has ticks, and therefore you should protect yourself. Um, or you could get these booklets if you want people to learn more about ticks because you feel like they've been getting exposed and you don't want them to get tick borne illness. All right, so in summary, um, you want to avoid getting 
bit by ticks however you can. So either you're dressing to prevent tick bites or you're checking yourself very early and often. Um, make smart choices about habitats where ticks thrive. So if you're going into an area to do some herping and you know that there's gonna be a lot of ticks there, then I would expect you're wearing the right clothing and that you're checking yourself and that you're throwing your clothes in the laundry for 10 minutes when you get home and taking a shower really quick so that you get any ticks off you. Um, you know, if you feel comfortable, then there are chemicals to treat your clothing to get rid of ticks or repellent sprays, but I understand that that doesn't work for a lot of situations that you guys are in. Uh, keep track of any tick bites that happen to you and consult a doctor if you have any symptoms. Most tick-borne illnesses should have a limited impact on you if you catch them early enough. So it's just important to be aware about your body and about any arthropods that are on it. <laughs> and that's pretty much it. That's my contact info if you have more questions after today. And I'm happy to take any now. I'm done. I don't know. Nobody has any questions. <laughs> you have a question. Oh, no. Nope. <laughs> <laughs>